happy to bring you here inside the church at the Holy Monastery of the Sacred Cross. We are in what they call the Valley of the Cross. Um, it's very near the Knesset for those of you who have been here or the Israeli Museum. All of that used to be property of this monastery which was in a place which didn't have a lot of development until just very recently. So in here you can breathe, see, just sense the history. You can really also sense the prayer this has been a sacred place for a very, very long time. So if I tell you a little about the history, I also have to tell you about the traditions. When you speak about this place theologically, it brings us to the memorial. A memorial is where you celebrate something which is archeological, historical as well. And the memorial is that this is the burial place of Adam. Adam as an Adam and Eve. And so from this place where Adam, the first man was buried, the cross, well, actually the tree from which the true cross was made grew. Theologically speaking, that's exactly right. And so this is what was memorialized or remembered from the very beginning. And this is also why you often see in iconography or in other uh, types of art, the cross over not just a place of the skull, but the skull of Adam, his burial place. All of that comes from here. So does it have any historical significance or is it just theological? If you do archaeology here, which they have done, you find the ruins of a Byzantine church, Byzantine from the very beginning. And that is because Constantine actually had this whole area consecrated, the earth consecrated. And then eventually he gave the land to a Georgian king. The country of Georgia is um, north of Lebanon. It's very close to Armenia. And it was very important for many, many years. And it was one of the very first countries whose king made Christianity the official religion after Armenia. I think they say it's around 325, more or less. And so Constantine gave this place to his contemporary, King Mariam III, who lived in Georgia. So this place, which is also called the Kingdom of Iberia, which is very interesting, became very, very Christian. And so they had this and eventually the first basilica was built in the fourth century or the 300s by the Iberian Prince Bakur. Now he is the grandfather to Peter of Iberia. And why is this person important? Because um, they say that he may have been not just a prince, but also a philosopher, and a theologian, and perhaps even the same pseudo-Dionysius, the Areopagite. And he wrote a number of very important Neoplatonic Christian writings. So this is where we are. There was a beautiful church here eventually in the 11th century. Uh, the, the Georgian monks built a monastery, and uh, the monk's name was Parochius of Iberia, so the same place, and then a Crusader monastery during the Crusader Kingdom. And that's when they had the window in the ground so you could actually see where these trees grew, one of which became the tree that was used for the cross. So unfortunately, as you know, if you look at the history of the Holy Land, there's been a lot of um, conflict and violence in the 13th century. All of the monks here were massacred. Eventually the Georgians were, be, were able to reobtain the property and continue the monastery, but eventually had to sell it. And thank goodness the Greeks were able to purchase it. So they are still here praying and keeping up this very holy place, the sacred monastery, the holy monastery of the cross. And so I wanna take you into a side chapel as we continue our reflection, so follow me.
So now we've come to the side chapel here in the current structure of the monastery. And it's because right under this altar to my left, where, right where we have left the pilgrim staff, is where I want all of you to be. You notice on the ground there is a silver circle. If you've been to the Holy Land, these point out some of the holiest places where salvation of history occurred, or history of salvation occurred. So what is in there? You can see the ground where the trees of this area grew. And so the first Christians, obviously, were the ones that pointed out to Constantine specifically this place where the wood for crucifixion was harvested. And so they've always kept it in the most special place in this area, under the high altar, now on this lateral altar, where people put offerings in. When you're on pilgrimage, instead of spending money on yourself, you want to give it for the sake of the monastery. You want to give her an offering to the Lord. And then also to my right, you can see these beautiful um, frescoes. They're on wood, actually, paintings of a really neat tradition. The style of the painting is not necessarily Greek. It's more what they call Georgian, which is, as I mentioned, close to Armenia, Turkey, that area, uh, who used to be the owners of this particular monastery. And it tells the story of Abraham. He was visited by the angels. Abraham, who, you know, left, interceded for Lot and his daughters when they had to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. And then you have him with three uh, shoots uh, for trees in his hands. And then you see him planting and watering those trees, they say perhaps in this very place. And then the devil's in the orchard because eventually, as you see, or in the grove, <clears throat> this wood is cut and fashioned into wood for crucifixions. And then right above this altar, which marks the spot where the cross, the wood for the cross grew, you see the crucifixion. As well, this beautiful cross with Mary and James. And this is the same style that you see right on Calvary. And that's not on accident. There is a close relationship between this monastery and Calvary itself. And the difference here is we don't have the silver covering the icons. So we're in the presence, actually it's kind of within a monastery, walking through the groves of trees that used to be used for really something of a curse. And that's because the cross has been transformed from a curse to a blessing. So what a perfect place to dive in again to prayer, our whole reflection, this Lent on prayer. You know, just yesterday we were talking about, or actually the last visit that we had, we've been talking about the sources of prayer the sacred scriptures, the today of prayer. And now we can jump into the most important thing about prayer, which is praying in the name of Jesus. Jesus is the one who brings us to the Father. And if you look at the cross, the cross that grew from here, that is the cross that brings us to Jesus. So before we jump into that, I wanted to actually read the testimony from a couple of pilgrims who came to this place, one in the 13th century, and so he's a Dominican pilgrim who wrote about his travels, and he said, <clears throat> We came to a fair church adjoining, which is a small monastery, wherein dwell Gregorian, or excuse me, Georgian monks. When we entered the church, we were led up to the high altar, uh, which is said to stand on the very spot where grew the tree of the Holy Cross, right here is where he was. And then in the 1600s, there's another one. It's a, Gregor a Georgian soldier, sorry. Um, and so he came here and he, he was, he actually, I'm sorry, this was a, a pilgrim who traveled with a Georgian soldier. And so anyway, he's from Oxford. He was a clergyman in the 1600s. And this is what he wrote when he came here. He says, the Holy Cross convent of, of the Greeks was here. And it's the earth here on this earth is the earth that nourished the root that bore the tree, that yielded the timber that made the cross under the high altar. And so he also describes how um, the guardian, meaning the Franciscans with whom he was traveling, actually washed the feet of the pilgrims right here. But we can just imagine people coming from the time of the 300s. This is 1700 years of pilgrimage here, kept sacred and uh, remembered by the first Christians in this area. So this brings us to prayer. Being in a place that is so sacred brings us to prayer. 
So we know that the Holy Spirit in the church teaches us, the children of God, how to pray. We've talked about this. We talked about it last time. It brings us back to John chapter 14. The Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name will teach you everything, will remind you of everything that I told you. And so there's a living transmission which comes through the Holy Spirit or by the Holy Spirit. It's a transmission, a living transmission of the Lord's teaching himself. And so we call this tradition. Living transmission is equal to tradition. So let's not get confused about what that means. And so it brings us to a personal relationship with the Lord. And as we talked about the sacred scripture, the liturgy, the virtues of faith, hope, and love, all of these are sources of prayer. And the church then, including this building, proposes a language of prayer. What is the language? What's a language which is shaped by the historical, by the social and the cultural context? And that's why it's so important to understand, oh, this was Georgian, but it was then part of the Byzantine Empire. And then, wait a minute, what about Rome? It's, it's so important to understand the languages of prayer in East and West so that we can be brought by the Holy Spirit into this personal relationship with the Lord. There's discernment and guidance which is needed to assure that our prayer is guided by the Holy Spirit and not like that little devil there in the grove which can lead us off, right? And also discernment is needed so that we pray according to tradition of the apostolic faith. That's why it was so important for Constantine and really his mother Helen who came here uh, to talk to the first Christians, those who knew the apostles who lived with Jesus. And of course, discernment is needed so that there can be an adequate explanation of the language of prayer. What does it mean, these words, Kyrie eleison? Why do we repeat them, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison? We repeat them in every, east and west. Lord have mercy. That's something of how important those words are. Or how about melodies? You know, during our time in Lent, and we'll continue to hear the way that there's a chant not only in the West, but the Eastern chant with this low hum underneath. Why does that happen? Let's understand this better. This, uh, we could call it monodic rather than polyphonic music. Why do we use organs, especially in Germany? It's because the voice, the, the, excuse me, the tubes of an organ sound like the vocal cords, so like the, you know, your throat, the tubes of a, of a human voice. That's, that's an organ. That's why it's used like by the Franciscans in the Holy Sepulcher. Um, why are there vocals versus instruments? Why are there instruments versus vocals in some things? And why about, what about choral music in general? When did it start in the church? The church actually began just repeating the Psalms back and forth like we repeat in the divine office, in the liturgy, and eventually it was sent to music. This is part of the discernment of what comes from the Holy Spirit, the words, like I said, the melodies. What about gestures? My hands like this, my hands like this. How about my hands like this beating my breast? Or, you know, the blessings that we see, you know, this type of movement or, or, or you know, this movement or this movement or this or this. Do I understand it? Is it legitimate? What is the Holy Spirit telling me about that language of prayer? And of course, what we've seen, and you can see so much here in Jerusalem, icons, icon, these windows into the divine. What do they mean? What are the colors? What's the gold? There's so much, so much that we need to know. And that's why explanation and catechesis is so important because they all, when they bring us to the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that it's in the spirit. So the language of prayer, the way of prayer. Well, we know the way, the truth, and the life. That's Jesus himself, Christ himself. And we know that it's only through Christ that we have access to the Father. So we want to pray in the Father's name. Who brings us there? The Lord, Christ. So Christian prayer is always characterized by this. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Be it communal prayer, personal prayer, vocal prayer, internal prayer, interior prayer. It's always done in Jesus' name. That's why we begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, because the sacred humanity of Jesus is the way by which the Holy Spirit teaches us to pray to God the Father. This is why I love this, this whole imagery behind us. It's very Trinitarian. What is Christian prayer? Christ-centered, Trinitarian. If we don't have that, we don't have Christian prayer. So what does it mean to pray in the name of Jesus? Well, we know from Exodus 3.14 that God revealed the name, his name, to Moses in the burning bush. 
I am. I am. But then if we look at the New Testament in Matthew chapter 1, the angel actually tells Mary what the name of her child will be. It's Jesus. So I am is Jesus. Jesus, as we know, it's a first century, <clears throat> excuse me, Jewish name, um, Jeshua, or in Greek, Jeseus, right? And that means Yahweh helps or Yahweh saves, which is what it's most commonly known as. The Lord saves. That's his name. So the name of Jesus contains everything. The divine name cannot be spoken by human lips if you ask a Jewish person. Y-H-W-H, the Lord, Adonai, anything except for the Lord's name, because it's only said, I think, as most of you know, by the high priest once a year in the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. That used to be, you know, when they had the temple. So, and that's a feast of forgiveness. And why is that? If you ask most rabbis or Jewish people, they'll explain it's because when you invoke the name of the Lord, there's a real consequence there. He becomes present. The power of God's name becomes present. And you don't want to take that power in vain. You, would, you don't want to use it kind of in a light way. So it's very interesting, right? But the divine name for Christians was handed down to us by the very word of God himself who was made flesh. By assuming our human nature, we can invoke the name of God in the name of Jesus. And that's why we can say that it encompasses everything. God, mankind, salvation history, the economy of salvation, which is just a big word for saying that God is working, governing, creation, um, God's activity in governing the world and saving the world. That's what it encompasses. Extraordinary. So to pray Jesus is to invoke him. It's to call him to be present within us. That's why it's so powerful to kneel here and invoke his name. So Jesus' name, just like what the Jewish people say, contains everything. Now, I think it's important, as we were talking about, to discern the different languages of prayer to go back to Acts of the Apostles. If you go back to chapter 2, let me just read this verse and see if you can remember where it comes from. It says, It shall be that everyone shall be saved who calls on the name of the Lord. Hmm. But then in Acts chapter 3, listen to this. By faith in his name, the faith that comes through it has given him perfect health. By faith in his name. What is this? Well, it's when Peter was coming in, remember, into the temple with John, and there was a crippled man. And he asked for, he was begging for something. It was in the name of Jesus that he was cured. It actually says, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, rise and walk. That's the power of praying in the name of Jesus. Whoever invokes the name of Jesus is welcoming the Son of God, God himself, who loved him and gave himself for us to live. That's in Galatians chapter 2. So what are the traditional invocations of Jesus' name throughout church history? That's why it's important to know church history. Well, there's, it's really a simple invocation of faith. And so if we go to one of my favorite places, the deserts of Egypt, Sinai, Syria, Mount Athos, also in Greece, well, those places actually um, kind of developed a beautiful language of prayer, which is what we've seen in the hands of monks and, and sisters, and that's the chatka. Remember, that's the name in Russian of the prayer rope. But I want to tell you the name in Greek is the kamboskini, okay? And even the Ethiopians, they have the same prayer rope, which, which is the Meketaria, okay, that's in Ge'ez, in the Ethiopian language. What's the essence of the Jesus prayer? Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on us sinners. What did they pray at the foot of the cross? Have mercy on us. These were words that Bartimaeus prayed to the Lord, have mercy on me, I cannot see. These are words that the publican prayed as he was in the, you know, praying, have mercy on me, a sinner. It's the combination of that. But it's also, and this is what I wanted to read for all of you, what St. Paul actually tells us in Philippians chapter 2, one of my favorite parts of St. Paul. He says, starting in verse 8, and this is what comes when we invoke the Lord's name, and this is the essence of the Jesus prayer in the Chaka. He himself, he humbled himself, 
becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and blessed him, uh, bestowing upon him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend of those in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Praying in Jesus' name, that's the power. So by this prayer, our heart is opened, the Lord's heart is opened, and so our human weakness comes face to face and is embraced by God's saving mercy. What a powerful prayer. What a powerful prayer. And of course, in the West, especially most recently, the, the uh, prayer, which is most common at three o'clock in the afternoon, the time when Jesus died on the cross is the chaplet of divine mercy. Uh, for the sake of your sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. It's the same. It's invoking his name. So the Jesus prayer, not just the chaka, just saying the name Jesus, Jesus, there's power there. It's really interesting. Sometimes we get questions by Jewish people who are seeking or might be curious about Christians, and they're like, is there power in that name? Well, yes, <laughs> especially because we know that the Lord Jesus is God. So the simplest way of praying this is just repeating that name, Jesus. Jesus. Is it a multiplication, a vain multiplication of words that the uh, gospel cautions us against? No. It's something that can be prayed anytime and all the time. There was a woman who was going through a terribly painful sickness and surgery, and what helped her, she said, is just a little wooden cross shaped like uh, her hand, very comfortable little hand. She took it into the operating uh, theater with her because it wasn't metal, and the only thing she could do because of the pain and because of everything that was happening was repeat that name, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, there's power there, possible always. It expresses the loving God who gives life and transfigures every action in Jesus Christ. Isn't that amazing? The other two things I just want to end with is the other Jesus prayer that we're common, very much more familiar with, is the prayer to the heart of Christ, the sacred heart of Jesus. The heart of Jesus, as it, we can see, is pierced for our sins out of love for us. It says in John 19, one of the soldiers opened his side with the lance, blood and water came out. And we actually say in that prayer, I adore you, I love you, I give you my poor heart in sorrow for my sins. It's just invoking him. It's invoking him, it's bringing us there. Pope Pius XII actually said about that prayer, the devotion to the sacred heart, the wound of the most sacred heart of Jesus remains a striking image of that spontaneous charity by which God gave his only begotten Son for the redemption of mankind, and by which Christ expressed his passionate love for us. This is the Jesus prayer. The other is what we've been praying part of every Friday during this Lenten journey, and we'll continue to do that, and that's the Jesus prayer is within the way of the cross. The way of the cross. We follow Jesus' steps who by his holy cross has redeemed the world. That's why this place is so important and so many people unfortunately don't know about it. We know on the cross was that sign, Jesus and Nazarene, King of the Jews. And it says in John that it was written in all the main languages of the world, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, everybody could see that. And this means when we say hail, O cross, our only hope, that things are never hopeless because all has been embraced, encompassed, and made new in God's love through the cross. In Jesus' name, to the Father, by the Holy Spirit, every knee will bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Amen. What a powerful place to come and speak about the prayer to the Father through the Lord's name, through Jesus' name. So join us again tomorrow as we speak about praying through the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, and know that from this very special place, this beautiful grove, where those crosses came from the trees that grew here, we've been praying for each and every one of you, and may God bless you.